David Friedman, welcome to the Liberated Podcast. Glad to be here. I am so honored to have you on the podcast. I have been familiar with your work for a number of years, but only recently discovered your advocacy of unschooling. So I want to spend most of our time today talking about education and unschooling, but perhaps we can begin with your own fascinating story of self-determination. You attended Harvard College in the 1960s, studied chemistry and physics, and then went on to earn a PhD in physics from the University of Chicago. Yet you are most well known for your work in economics and law and libertarian theory. And you taught for years at Santa Clara University School of Law, retiring in 2017. So I'm curious how and why you made the shift from science to economics and law fields in which you are largely self-taught? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, I grew up in with, with parents who were economists. And the reason I chose initially to go into physics was that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life being identified as my father's son. Uh, and physics was obviously an interesting subject. It was something I was good at. Uh, and so I got a doctorate. And then I went to uh, Columbia University as a postdoc in the physics department. And at Columbia University, I had reached the point where the people I was interacting with were just as smart as I was and considerably more interested in physics than I was. Uh, and at the same time, I had been interested in economics for a long time. I was writing my first book while I was a physics graduate student. And it was a book on basically sort of economics, libertarianism, a bunch of related ideas of that sort. Uh, and somebody, the, the head of the Population Council thought it would be interesting to see something on population issues. I should say, I don't, I don't know how many of your listeners will, are old enough to remember, but back in the 1960s and early 70s, population played the same role that climate change does now. It was the looming catastrophe, which all the experts warned us we had to do something drastic about. Uh, and as an economist, it seemed to me that the basic question was, when the number of people in the world increases by one, are the net effects on other people positive or negative? And everybody assumed the answer was negative. Uh, and the head of the Population Council wanted to see a discussion of this issue by somebody who was in favor of the market, because that was not the position that was generally being argued. And he asked me to write something. So I wrote a piece for them in which I simply tried to calculate the positive and negative effects of an additional person on the rest of the world, uh, not counting his family, which is people who chose to have him and therefore obviously think they benefit. Uh, and I concluded that I couldn't tell whether the net was positive or negative, that these were, there were sizable positive, sizable negative, both quite uncertain. And that, I should say, is the conclusion I reached many years later about climate change, that, that it clearly has negative effects. It also has quite sizable positive effects. People generally ignore the latter, focus only on the former. Anyway, so I did that. And then somebody who I guess had seen that, uh, seen something of mine, uh, who was running a sort of semi-independent center at University of Pennsylvania, offered to find me a position as a postdoc at his center if I wanted to switch fields. And so I accepted that because it was reasonably clear to me that when I was in a room where somebody was giving a talk on physics, I was one of the people at the back of the hall of the room trying to follow it once I was a postdoc. And when I'm in a room where somebody's giving a talk on economics, I'm one of the people at the front of the room saying, but that's wrong and why don't you do that and so forth. So it was pretty clear which was the field I belonged in. Uh, so I spent, I guess, two years, I think, as a postdoc at Penn and one year as a lecturer at Penn. And during that time, I wrote my first economics published journal article. And that was a economic theory of the size and shape of nations. And it was a, quite a fun idea trying to explain the general shape of the map of Europe from the fall of the Roman Empire to the present. Uh, and it started with a puzzle that didn't seem to bother anybody else, which was when the Roman Empire fell, why did it break? Why wasn't it replaced by another state of similar size? Uh, and I had a theory uh, and a model of what determined what, which of two different countries got a piece of land in between them, essentially. Uh, 
And I, I wrote that up and I ended up publishing it in the JPE, Journal of Political Economy, which is a fairly top journal. Uh, and then I met Jim Buchanan, who was the person who was more or less running things at VPI in the Public Choice Center and their economics department. And he was in the process of inventing what became known as public choice theory, which was the application of economics to government. My article was in fact a different approach at the application of economics to government. So he invited me to come to VPI as an assistant professor in economics, having never taken an economics course in my life. Uh, when I got there, Jim's colleague, Gordon Tullock, who was a very interesting guy, uh, used to boast that he had published more pages in economics than he than had been assigned in all of the economics courses he had taken. And I told him I achieved that with my first page, uh, which was true. So I spent a number of years at VPI. Uh, eventually, uh, well, visited to some other places, but eventually went off to UCLA for a number of, of years. Uh, then uh, the woman who I had been courting for the previous six years finally I decided on the virtue of long-term contracting. Uh, she was working for Shell Oil uh, as a geologist in New Orleans at the time. So I got a position at Tulane in New Orleans and we got married. We're still married, that was a long time ago. Uh, and uh, while I, I was doing more or less straightforward economics at Tulane, I'd written my first uh, economics textbook. And I then got involved in a controversy at Chicago between two of the U of C economists, uh, Gary Becker and George Stigler, and two of the law and econ people in the law school, uh, Judge Posner and Bill Landis. And that controversy involved a proposal for, in some sense, privatizing the prosecution of criminal law. Uh, and it was an interesting idea. It would take a while to explain it. But I got interested and I wrote two articles, one of which was a historical article because I knew of a society that had done something not too far from what Becker and Stigler were proposing, namely Iceland a thousand years ago, saga period Iceland, where if you killed somebody, his relatives sued you in effect. Uh, and then a theoretical article showing, I think, that one of the arguments that Landis and Posner had made was wrong. That, I, I had, that something they said was impossible, there was a way of doing it. Uh, so at that point, Landis and Posner invited me to come to Chicago to argue with them at shorter range. And I ended up spending something like eight or 10 years as a faculty fellow at University of Chicago Law School, uh, writing stuff and doing a little teaching, but mostly research. Uh, eventually, uh, it became clear that Landis and Posner were not going to be able to persuade their colleagues that they needed another economist as a full-time professor at the law school. And at that point, uh, Santa Clara University uh, had, uh, was interested in somebody in law and econ. There was somebody in the econ, econ department there who I knew who I thought highly of. And most of my family were in California. My parents, my sister, my uncle were all in, in California at that point. So I accepted a position at SCU and spent 20 some years uh, as a half-time full professor teaching law and econ and embedding other courses. So my most recent book came out of a seminar that I invented, uh, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago or so at SCU. Uh, and the history of that really goes back to the Icelandic paper because it occurred to me that I had, that in trying to understand this thousand year old legal system very different from ours, it had really been interesting and I'd learned things. And then at a later point, I had done another article on 18th century English criminal law, which was a system where there were essentially no police. It was a, it, on paper, it was our system, except that it was up to the victim to catch the criminal uh, or people who worked for the victim. Uh, so I got interested in that and wrote an article on that. And it occurred to me that both of those articles have been a lot of fun and I'd learned a lot. And I'd been very lazy since then. So I needed a way of getting myself to investigate more interesting legal systems. So I announced that the next year I was going to do a seminar in legal systems very different from ours. And then I had to read up on a whole bunch of legal systems. And that ended up as a book called Legal Systems Very Different from Ours that I published a few years ago uh, and was a lot of fun. So that's basically the history of what, of, of what happened. 
I love. love this image of you sitting in the back during physics classes, but in the front during economics classes and really speaks to this idea of sort of passion driven learning and yep. following your curiosity. Now, but when, I'm not talking about classes because after I didn't take any economics right. classes, I'm talking about when a professor Seminars, from one school yeah. comes to another school to give a talk about the paper sure. he's written or sure, he's writing sure. and you then discuss it. Uh, so, and I should say a lot of that is, I, I knew a good deal of economics to start with, but in addition at VPI, I ended up teaching a wide range of subjects and teaching a course is a good way of learning the material. And some of my articles, at least one of my articles came out of the fact that I had been saying something to my students for years and I eventually concluded it wasn't true. Uh, and then rethought that particular set of issues and wrote an article that came out of it. Uh, so you first published your well-known book, Machinery of Freedom, Guide yeah. to a Radical Capitalism in 1973 yes. and have revised it since. It's now in its third edition. It explains the theory of anarcho-capitalism and what a society based on these free market mm -hmm. principles would look like. For those listening who may not know quite what you mean by anarcho-capitalism, can you offer a brief overview of the concept or what you call sure. the kindergarten version in your book? Oh, no. The, the kindergarten version, I think, is describing a society less advanced than ours, but I think it's easier to get, that, that's one chapter of the third edition, but, but it's easier to put it in terms of imagining a society where instead of having a government, you have firms that sell their service, their customers the service of protecting their rights and uh, settling their disputes. So everybody is the customer, customer of one of many such firms, just as nowadays, almost everybody's got say auto insurance. Uh, if there is a conflict between a customer of one company and one customer of another, in principle, they could start fighting each other, but that's very expensive. And these are private companies that want to make money. It makes much more sense for each pair of companies to agree in advance on an arbitrator, to agree in advance on a private court that will settle their disputes. And now somebody who is very clever may say, but agreeing doesn't do anything because there's no government to enforce agreements. But these are repeat players. So each firm knows that if it refuses to go along when the judge rules against its customer, the other one won't go along when the judge rules the other way, and then they'll have to fight each other, and then they'll have to pay hazard pay to their employees, and then they'll lose all their customers to somebody who's uh, got a less violent view of the world. So that's the basic, the basic sketch of, this, of, of the system. In my, uh, and it turns out that it's a more... Uh, elaborate and a sort of higher division of labor version of something that's existed in a fair number of societies. That's one of the things that came out of my legal system is very different, that there are a variety of societies where the basic rule has been that if you wrong me, you owe me compensation. And if you don't give me compensation, I'll do something bad to you. And then that raises a number of problems. I have a chapter in, in legal systems book on what I call feud law and discusses the different ways in which real societies in the past, including my Icelandic society, have in fact solved that, those problems. So, so I didn't realize it when I wrote the book, but in an odd sense, I was reinventing the wheel. Uh, but I was reinventing it in something like my society, not in a society a thousand years ago with much less division of labor and, and, and you know, much less elaborate institutions. Uh, but that's the basic idea. And the argument in particular for people who are in general in favor of free markets, but don't want to carry it that far. The argument I like to offer is that you agree that governments are bad at building cars and at growing food. And that if the government is in charge of growing food and building cars, we're likely to have expensive cars that don't work very well and we might go hungry. Making law is not an easy problem. It looks easy if you think about it for a minute and just say, well, you know, if you violate my rights, you get punished. But if you actually go to law school uh, or teach at a law school, you realize that figuring out what those rights are and what the appropriate recourses are and how you deal with it is a very complicated problem. Well, if the government isn't competent to grow food or build cars, it probably isn't competent to make law either. And then my argument is that I've described the system where law is made by something not too different from the way cars are made in the free market. That is to say that the private court wants a set of legal rules and procedures 
that it can sell to the arbiter to, to, to the rights enforcement agencies. The rights enforcement agencies want a court that has rules that their customers like. So that means that it's sort of like a market where you're trying to produce a product which the ultimate consumers will prefer. And unlike the political situation, the ultimate consumers have a choice. The ultimate consumer knows that he, by choosing which rights enforcement agency he goes with, he has at least some choice. So they're, they're obviously not all legal rules are gonna be available, but he can say of these agencies, which one seems to do the best job of, of, of settling disputes, which is gonna depend partly on the court they've got. Uh, my friend and neighbor has got his customer of a different agency, does it seem to do better and so forth. So that in the political market, you really never get decent comparisons. That all you can do is say, is what Biden did for the last two years better or worse than what I think Trump would have done? But nobody ever knows. And that's true all the way back because every president faces a different set of conditions. Uh, so you, you don't really have a decent way of doing, as it were, comparison shopping. Everybody thinks they do. Everybody believes they know that the Republicans, or if they prefer the Democrats, are the good guys and the other side of the bad guys. But in fact, it's almost all sort of cheering for a football team, not rational shopping. Uh, and in my system, you can do a reasonable amount of rational shopping. So that's that's the guts of the of the system. But if you want, if people want to know about it, uh, the second edition of Machinery of Freedom is a free download from my webpage, which is daviddfriedman.com. And it has my original sketch of it. And the third edition is a fairly inexpensive Kindle from Amazon, because I try to make my stuff cheap if I can. Uh, and that's got a further discussion and some expansion of some of the ideas in that one. So if the government isn't good at building cars or growing food, it's also not good at schooling. And in the That's first true. edition of Machinery of Freedom, you have a chapter entitled Sell the Schools, which you begin by asking, how is a public school like the U.S. Post Office? Answer, it's inefficient. It costs more each year than the last. It is a perpetual subject of complaint about which nothing is ever done. It is, in short, a typical government monopoly. You then go on to talk about vouchers that you argue help to get the government out of the schooling business. Uh, this idea of vouchers for education was popularized by your father, Milton Friedman, in the 1950s, who similarly argued that these funding mechanisms would loosen the grip of government on schooling. Since you wrote that chapter, and even since the third edition of Machinery of Freedom was published in 2014, there have been significant gains in the school choice movement, and especially over the past couple of years of education disruption. I wonder if you can talk about some of the successes you see regarding school choice policies and what more needs to be done to fully separate school and state. Yeah, I'm afraid the real answer is that I'm not an expert on I don't actually, I'm, I'm on the board of directors of, of a foundation my parents started for pushing vouchers, so I read their stuff. But watching what's happening to that movement is not my professional interest as it is. So it's reasonably clear that the number of uh, kids with access to vouchers has steadily gone up. But I think the total number is still something like 1% or 2%. It's that kind of scale. So it's still pretty small. Uh, it maybe maybe it's more by this year because there's been a lot of, of movement as a result of the COVID and the lockdowns and so forth. Uh, but uh, so the, I, I think it's a good idea, but but I can't say that I can give a good that I'm a good person to give a summary of the of of, of the progress in which states have gotten. That I I get emails on this subject from time to time, but it's not something I really keep track of. Uh, but but I gather you're interested in the subject of unschooling. Yeah, so let's dig into unschooling then. And I, I can't tell you how delighted I was to stumble upon a YouTube video of a presentation you gave in 2021 on the topic of education and unschooling. And that led me to find the essay on your blog entitled Unschooling, a Libertarian Approach to Children, which was ultimately incorporated into the third edition of Machinery of Freedom. So yeah. can you tell us how you came to embrace this idea of unschooling? Huh, that's an interesting question. I guess it just seems obvious to me from my own education that one learns things mostly when you're interested in learning them, 
and not mostly when somebody sits you down and makes you learn them. That even if I go back long before the, my, my professional education, uh, when I was about 10, we spent a year in Cambridge, England. The house we rented had a complete Kipling poetry and a complete Tennyson poetry in it. And I learned a lot of the poems and liked them. And I've liked poetry, especially Kipling, but a lot of other people as well ever since. And I think, I think I remember very vaguely one poem I ever had to memorize in school, but quite a lot of poems that I memorized for myself. So that's, it just seemed to me the obvious way of, of, of teaching uh, kids. Uh, and when we moved to California, uh, my daughter was briefly in a local Montessori school and we, she, my wife wasn't terribly happy with how they were doing things for, I guess the particular thing that set my wife off, my wife's a geologist and she listened to a presentation that somebody was giving to the kids about sort of the sequence of changes in, in the earth over the last several hundred million years and they had it wrong. That is to say they, I think if I, if I remember correctly, it's quite a while ago, grass is actually quite a late development and they had grass growing up, you know, when the people were, when, when the animals were coming out of the ocean. And she pointed this out to somebody at the school and they didn't care. That is, that was what shocked her, not that you make mistakes, of course people make mistakes, but that they were really regarding telling kids as a way of entertaining them as it were, or as a way of giving them sort of general principles. And the minor question of whether they told the kids was true didn't seem to be very important. And that disturbed her, disturbs me uh, when I see it in lots of other contexts. Uh, and at the time, there was a very small uh, private school being started on unschooling lines that we somehow heard about. So we decided to investigate it. And we took Becca, my daughter, our daughter to that school and to visit it. And she said she'd rather go there than to the Montessori school. So we shifted her over to that. And a couple of years, a few years later, as her brother got old enough, we shifted him there. Uh, and my the school was, was, was modeled on Sudbury Valley School, which you're familiar with. And Sudbury Valley School really has two principles, freedom and democracy. And I'm in favor of freedom. Uh, but I don't think political mechanisms are a very good way of running things. They may work better for small things than for big things. Uh, but in the case of that particular school, eventually it developed in ways we were unhappy with and uncomfortable with, where basically the way I like to put it is that there are no compulsory school classes in a, a Sudbury model school, which is fine. But there's sort of an implicit compulsory class in small group politics. Because if you don't learn how to do small group politics, somebody else is going to control your environment for you. Uh, and so we ended up shifting to home unschooling. And that's what the kids did until they grade the equivalent of graduated from high school until they got the age at which they uh, applied to colleges. And I'm still not entirely certain if they should have gone to college or not, because some of the same arguments apply, though there's a good deal more ability at a college to study what you want instead of what somebody else tells you to study. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, that was, that was what we did and we were pretty happy with the results. Uh, and I ended up with a daughter who knew less about a few things than high school kids did, but a whole lot more about other things. Uh, one of the problems for homeschooling in general, not just unschooling, is that when you, if you want to apply to college, the colleges expect things like transcripts and teacher recommendations of where that you don't have. And one of the things that Becca did instead was to send them a list of the books she had read, 400 of them. <laughs> and one of the colleges, St. Olaf, which accepted her and offered her money, the admissions person told us that was what they blew, what blew them away. So, but in general, it just, it just I, I guess a lot of my, my, of my views are sort of a priori rather than empirical because I've got such a small sample. I know what worked for me, but not for everybody in the world. Uh, but it just seems to me that people, that kids learn things much more when they're things they want to learn than when they're things somebody else tells them to learn. And that there are a huge number of subjects in the world worth studying. And the standard K through 12 curriculum is a small subset of that that somebody has decided everybody should pretend to study. Uh, I guess really study, pretend to learn. Uh, 
And it, I don't think it makes very much sense that, you know, if, if probably it's useful to know some arithmetic and it's clearly useful to know how to read, uh, but those are things that, at least in our experience, it's very easy to teach kids. If they, the only, the critical thing is that you teach kids by having them read things they want to read, uh, not things that the teacher thinks they ought to read. Uh, and if you're willing to do that, I think most kids will learn to read. Uh, and you then basically uh, tell them about things, talk with the kids, see what interests them, encourage them to pursue their interests, uh, which is what we did, did with our kids. Uh, so I remember one of the books that Becker read was a very good biography of uh, Talleyrand, who was a he was a member of the French uh, Foreign Service just before the revolution. In the course of the next few years, of, 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 of the next, what, 15 or 20 years, he was successively the minister, the foreign minister of the Republic, the foreign minister of the system that followed the Republic, the foreign minister of Napoleon's empire. Uh, eventually fell out with Napoleon when Napoleon uh, wanted to invade Russia and Talleyrand told him not to. Uh, and arguably, after Napoleon, oh, after Napoleon's defeat, he was, I think, the foreign minister, and he was heavily involved in, in, in working for the French royal government that replaced Napoleon, and is suspected to have been behind a coup that replaced one French king with another king when he was an old man. So he was sort of a very, very successful and interesting politician, uh, interesting character. Uh, he was somebody who everybody who didn't know him hated him and everybody who knew him, knew him liked him. He was sort of seen as a devious figure. Uh, so Becker read it and thought it was really interesting as did I when I read it. And it turned out that Talleyrand had written memoirs. So she asked me to get her a copy of the memoirs. So I did. And she felt, felt that she was likely to be writing things about politics. And it would be really interesting to see a view of politics from the world, from the viewpoint of a master politician. So that's the sort of thing. Similarly, Becca, Becca spent a good deal of time on World of Warcraft. And some, a couple of the people he played with were French Canadians who uh, spoke English fluently. And she felt that if other people were gonna learn her language, she should learn somebody else's language. And she decided she really liked Italian because she and her mother do early singing um, uh, early music, and she liked songs in Italian. So uh, my university had a summer program for high school kids to take one college course. Uh, so she took a quarter of Italian, liked it. Uh, since I was a professor, she could enroll in, the in, in a class without actually being in the college, without having to pay for it. So she took the rest of the year of Italian. Uh, worked harder, I think, than I have ever worked in a class that I can remember because she wanted to, sure. uh, and ended up uh, with a degree from University of Chicago in Italian or Italian literature, whatever they call it. Uh, so in general, I think it makes a whole lot of sense to let kids follow, uh, follow what they want. And, you know, the parents certainly have a role. The parents know a whole lot about more about the world than an eight-year-old. So you can introduce them to things, talk about things. Generally, our rule when the kids were little was that my wife and I alternated who put which of them to bed and we spent about half an hour putting them to bed and, and she would tell stories from when she was little or, or sing them songs. I don't sing, I'm entirely non-musical. Uh, I would make up, recite poems or, or, or make up stories to tell them. Uh, so in general, uh, you talk with kids uh, and, and you then help them pursue their interests. That's, what we did and what worked for us. Now, I don't want to overstate it because kids are different. And I am sure that there are some kids for whom this is the right approach. But my guess is that there are a lot of kids for whom it is. Sure. What a great snapshot of what unschooling was like for your family and a description about what wonder, wonderful things can happen when we uh, inject education with freedom over coercion. Um, one of my favorite passages is from your essay, Unschooling, a Libertarian Approach to Children, which also appears in the third edition of Machinery of Freedom. I'll read it here. You write, judged by our experience, unschooling not only saved our children from having to spend a substantial part of every week sitting in class being bored, it also gave them a better education. Mm 
You go on to say in that essay, unschooling worked for us, but two very bright children brought up by highly educated parents are not exactly a random sample of the relevant population. There is evidence that it works for quite a lot of other people. Interested readers may want to look at the literature on Sudbury Valley schools, a model that the school where our children started their unschooling experience was built on. There may be some children who would learn more in a conventional school, even children who would enjoy the process more. But judging by our experience, unschooling, homeschooling, home unschooling, if no suitable school is available, is an option well worth considering. So I wonder if you can talk a bit more about this, specifically when you write unschooling, home unschooling, if no suitable school is available, it sounds like you suggest that unschooling that happens in a type of school, like a Sudbury style school, may be preferable to the home yes. unschooling that you did ultimately, and yeah. that homeschoolers yes. might practice. So can you elaborate on that a little sure. bit? Sure, of course. Uh, the advantage, there, there are two advantages, it seems to me, two related advantages to doing it in, in, in a school, if you can. One of them is just the kids like to socialize, they make friends. They, uh, and the other uh, is that other people's enthusiasms may be contagious. I didn't know that geology was an interesting subject until I fell in love with a geologist. Uh, and more generally, if you've got a friend who really is interested in space and talks about it all the time, it's quite likely that you'll discover that actually space is interesting and we'll learn things there. And similarly for any other subject for economics or mathematics or, uh, so I think that in general, both kids enjoy the socializing and socializing is a useful skill. Uh, the first homeschooled family who I knew way back in the 1960s uh, were extremely bright kids. When I first knew them, the younger son was, I think, the under 14 chess champion of the U.S., and the older son was, I think, the under 21 chess champion of the U.S. <laughs> uh, and I still know one of them. In fact, he runs the Federalist Society. Uh, and I would say he still comes across as socially clumsy. He's a very successful person and obviously very smart, but I don't think he's got as, as good sort of automatic building habits of how you interact with other people uh, as random, uh, as people who've grown up in an ordinary pattern do. On the other hand, he's much better educated uh, and he's obviously a, a productive person. I've, I haven't kept track of his older brother, but I gather he's also had a successful life and he's a lawyer somewhere. But anyway, but, but so I'd be, I, I would be, I would think that it would be desirable. And my reservation with the Sudbury model from the, our school, as I say, is the problem that democracy is not my favorite way of running things. And a Sudbury school in principle is run by majority vote of uh, students and, and faculty, students and staff. So that my ideal system, which doesn't exist, would be to have multiple competing unschooling private schools in which the unschooling school is run by whoever owns it, just like an ordinary school, but is constrained to treat the students properly by the fact that if not, they'll leave for another school, which is the way we handle most things in the, in the free market. Uh, but then with the schools being explicitly run on an unschooling basis, and the way at least we saw it with a very small school was basically that a class only happens when some of the kids go to somebody on the staff and say, we like a class in something. So that with, 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 the, with the school that our kids went to, at some point the kids decided they'd like to learn math. And they had a math class, which started out with arithmetic, started out with essentially knowing nothing. It had kids of a fairly wide range of age. And at the end of the year, they were into algebra. So that meant that they had done roughly, what, six or seven years of an ordinary K through 12 system in something under a year. Uh, and I think that's typical because those are kids. The, but of course, the only kids in that class were the ones who decided they wanted to learn math. Uh, and so I think I think it's a nice model, uh, and I would like to see it uh, much more available, uh, maybe so that I can have grandchildren or great grandchildren who've got options up uh, available. My kids are a little old for that now. Uh, so uh, anyway, so that that would be my my view is that 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 a, that a unschooling school. Now, Sudbury Valley may work. It, obviously, democracy doesn't always collapse. Uh, you know, they're <laughs> functional democratic societies. Uh, but but I think I, I think the market is a better way than democracy of even running schools. Uh, 
So let's end then by talking a little bit more about education entrepreneurship and the free market and education, because you and I might try to encourage more entrepreneurship in sort of the unschooling and self-directed education space and, and hope to see a proliferation of private schools that run on these unschooling principles. But I get the sense that you and I also agree that sort of a robust free market in education would have a whole variety of different educational philosophies yes. and approaches for families Correct. to choose from. And so in your sell the schools chapter in Machinery of Freedom, you talk about education entrepreneurship. This is a topic near and dear to my heart. I've really been inspired by the sheer amount of education entrepreneurship that's emerged over the past couple of years mm -hmm. uh, with the COVID disruption, you know, parents and teachers exiting government schools and creating these private learning pods and micro schools yeah. and hybrid schools and homeschool yes. collaboratives. And really some really ambitious entrepreneurs creating mm -hmm. scalable networks of these models. So yes. So you write about educational entrepreneurship in the chapter, you're talking about how these educational entrepreneurs can find ways to provide better education at lower cost. Yes. Uh, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about your sense of a truly free market in education and what that might look like. Well, I guess part of it is that it's not just K through 12, that the college system isn't great either. It costs what seems like an unreasonably large amount. I actually have uh, a blog post somewhere uh, in which I work out what you could run a law school for if you were not constrained by a whole bunch of rules put in, in effect by the American Bar Association and similar professional groups. And all you want to do is to teach the kids law. Uh, and it works out to, I don't know, a third or a quarter or a fifth what they actually, what it actually costs to go to law school. Uh, and at the same time, it seems to me, I mean, a fair number of people have argued that the present colleges don't consistently teach very much, that if you actually look at what people know when they graduate, a fair fraction of them don't really know any more than when they arrived. Uh, and in a sense, the colleges seem to be f serving, uh, I guess, two or three different functions. Uh, one of them is teaching things. One of them is testifying to a future employer that you're bright because you got into the college. And one of them is testifying to a future employer that you're at least sufficiently hardworking to get through the college. And it would seem to me there ought to be less expensive uh, and pleasanter ways of doing those things. Uh, so I would like to see a world where the education is happening less in the form of a four-year college and more in the form of uh, people taking stuff online, reading books, maybe having individual teachers offer classes and be paid for doing that. And I should say that that's not fair. I, there, there's another very large function of the colleges and that's mate search. That, that one of the main human activities after all is finding a mate. And a college is taking a bunch of rather similar people uh, putting them together in a pool for four years, which is a good chance to look for girlfriend, boyfriend, also to make other kinds of friendships, it's not just mate search, but it's largely that. So it would be nice if one would could develop, to some extent, maybe one has developed other mechanisms for that. I'd, like, I'd sort of like to see uh, an area of a city, say, uh, you know, a few blocks, which, which, where everybody knew that that was where all the students lived. And some of the students were teaching themselves and some of the students were uh, going to some official college and some of the students were doing an online college and they all socialized and they had parties and stuff like that. So if you think about things like Greenwich Village say, which for artists for a long time had that kind of function uh, and you could do it by clustering around an existing college and just say, well, some people here are paying money to the college and some of them aren't and the ones who aren't uh, can still take advantage of going to public lectures and uh, doing various other things. So, so, so I think that in general, my feeling is it would be nice if you could loosen up that whole system. It goes back to something that you were quoting before, the fact that my memory and my wife's memory of high school is being bored. And that's right, that uh, my wife says that she used to make very elaborate mazes and then give them to one of the other girls to try to solve. Uh, 
And I don't know what I did, but I know that most of the, there were a few exceptions. There were a few good teachers or interesting subjects, but an awful lot of the time I was sitting there being bored. Uh, and that isn't what happens when you're studying things for yourself. Uh, and I mean, I can even see it in my current work. I'm, I'm currently working on what's probably gonna be another book or two. And when I'm sitting there writing, I sort of not sure I wanna write, but when I've got a particular question I wanna find out, I go online and say, well, how could I investigate this? Well, where is where are these documents? What did this person say? That's really fun. Uh, and I think it would be nice if more of education, a different problem with the conventional model of education is one of the really important intellectual skills is the ability to evaluate sources of information on internal evidence. Mm. That, that all sorts of people are telling you things online, in real world, and so forth. How do you decide which ones are true? And the standard K through 12 model is anti teaching that skill because you're in a classroom, you have two sources of information, the textbook and the teacher, and you're supposed to believe them. Uh, now, a good teacher, that may not be true, but there aren't that many good teachers. Uh, and what you really want is somebody who says, well, you know, you say this, but how do you know it's true? What's the evidence? Uh, and similarly, if you're looking on things online, you ought to develop a habit when you read somebody saying something online of saying, does he sound like somebody who is trying to persuade me or like somebody who cares whether what he says is true? Is he, if he's arguing for something, can I think of any good arguments against it that he hasn't mentioned? I shouldn't be able to. If he's doing an honest job, he will have thought of all the arguments against it and then try to refute them or to concede that they're real arguments or whatever. So there are a bunch of intellectual skills of that sort, which I think are very important in the world and which people aren't getting, most people are not getting taught in college. Uh, so I guess that's part of, of what it seems to me an unschooling model uh, encourages. Mm, right. Right. And it's such a prime moment now for unschooling and self-directed education where we have access to so much information and yes. knowledge literally at our fingertips. So Correct. the time has never been better. And you've uh, got well, things is, like the Khan Academy, which will right. present it to you in apparently a fairly organized fashion. Right. And I think that's an important part of unschooling that maybe we didn't touch on um, enough is just this idea that it doesn't mean that you're not taking formal classes like your daughter Becca taking Italian, yes. uh, but that it's all self-chosen and self-directed. Right. And some of the other people who, who I've comment on my blog in particular, talk about using junior colleges sure. uh, or not, is that junior? There's a different term. Community colleges. Community colleges that, that a high school age kid takes some classes at community colleges and he takes the ones that interest him uh, and a number of them have found that to be a very useful, very useful approach. No, that's right. Uh, well, I could the, spend the, the, all day I, talking with you. Yeah. Let me say one one more Please. thing, and that is that the other building block you need for the for the college level is a better testing system. You need some way in which somebody who's self educated mm. can prove to the employer that he is as well educated as somebody who graduated from a good school, and. That mean, there's no reason you can't do that. That would be doing things like educational testing, but you'd have to do it with an organization that was good enough at it so people took its results seriously. Uh, and I think there are fields where that is true. I'm pretty sure that there are, I think, I think Microsoft has some, some uh, certificates that they give and some other people in particular professions, but more of that would help. Anyway, thank you. So what is the best way for my listeners to find and follow you, your work? My web page is daviddfriedman.com. It has a link to my blog, which is not very active at the moment. And if you look hard, it also has a link to what I'm doing at the moment, which is taking about four, the ideas in the, in the last 14 years of blog posts and converting those ideas into a book or, or, or maybe a couple of books. So I've got, I'm doing basically draft chapters and there is a link to that on, on, the, on, on my webpage. And you can see what I've written over the last few years uh, that hasn't yet been published. David Friedman, thank you again for being on the Liberated Podcast. Thank you very much for letting me be here. Bye-bye.